So I'm going to be overviewing electromagnetic uh, counterparts to gravitational wave sources, by which I'm actually going to be focusing on stellar mass gravitational wave or kilohertz sources. Um, and you know, I think we all know uh, that we've now entered the era of gravitational wave astronomy. I'm actually surprised no one, basically Stan, I think, is the only person who has yet uh, shown the discovery by LIGO uh, this, this well, last fall of, of gravitational waves from uh, in spiraling stellar mass binaries with a total mass of about 60 solar masses. I think Vicky will cover this uh, in her talk. Uh, this is obviously extremely exciting and, and is, is great motivation for uh, this sort of electromagnetic follow-up game that we hope to be conducting routinely now. Um, of course, you know, with black hole systems, we don't expect that there are, at least we didn't expect that there are many baryons around the system. And so most of my overview is going to be focusing on, on binary neutron stars, although I will say something very briefly about binary black holes. But this is obviously great motivation to proceed forward. So, uh, so we have different channels for getting, uh, for different outcomes if you have two neutron stars or a neutron star and a black hole and a binary. So they inspire slowly through gravitational radiation. At some, you know, they come into a point of merger. If the equation of state is, is soft or the mass of the binary is, is large, we think that the formed object almost immediately collapses into a black hole. But this is probably not the most common outcome. In most cases, for realistic equations of state, you form a temporarily uh, stable hypermassive neutron star, which is supported by its differential rotation. It's like basically a spinning uh, peanut, and it continues to radiate gravitational waves. And then at some point, when it loses that rotational support, it will collapse into a black hole. And this actually facilitates forming a fairly massive accretion disk around the system. It's even possible in some cases if the equation of state is sufficiently stiff, if it can support a sufficiently massive neutron star, or if the uh, binary is, is low mass, that you might actually form a stable neutron star, uh, a millisecond uh, neutron star that doesn't ever collapse into a black hole. In the case of, of neutron star and uh, black hole binaries, the outcome depends on the mass of the black hole. If the black hole is very massive, greater than about 10 solar masses, depending on spin, it will swallow the neutron star hole, and we don't think you get uh, much at all in the way of a debris disk. However, if the black hole is less massive, you, it will tidally disrupt the neutron star outside of its horizon, and this is another way to form uh, a massive accretion disk. I think Vic, um, uh, uh, what we're going to hear in the, in, in, in the afternoon, uh, Vicky's going to talk a little bit more uh, about the rates of these events, but we expect that the, the advanced LIGO region at full sensitivity that we could detect a few, possibly up to hundreds of mergers per year. So that'll be very exciting. Uh, of course, the challenge as astronomers is that you know, individual interferometers don't really localize the sources, so only by triangulating the arrival time do we determine the error regions. And even once we have the two LIGO and Virgo op op operating near the end of this decade, we expect typical error regions of tens or hundreds of square degrees. And these are much larger uh, you know, than the fields of view of most optical radio follow-up telescopes. Um, and in fact, things are worse now. Uh, where we just have the two LIGO interferometers in North America. We have these sort of large banana-shaped error regions on the sky uh, above the northern and southern uh, hemisphere. Um, and in fact, this is the uh, air region for the binary black hole event, which was 90%, I think, contour was several, you know, 600 square degrees, okay? So if you're trying to search this large air region of the sky, you, you know, it helps to know uh, what you're looking for, and that is sort of the motivation for coming up with theoretical models for counterparts. So I'm going to show you a numerical GR simulation of two merging neutron stars. This is not my own work, but um, you'll see the, the, the basic process. It actually takes several orbits for the two neutron stars. They start off uh, separated, and they take several orbits for them to to come into contact here. Um, and then you'll see that they coalesce, as I mentioned, into this sort of massive uh, peanut-shaped, uh, uh, dumbbell-shaped object, which is, and there's a point of, of, of ejecta that's, that's, that's uh, emitted during that merger process, which is very violent. You can get some tidal tails coming out. And this thing in the center is, is, is rotating, losing energy to gravitational waves, and then ultimately it will collapse to a black hole. And because you had some matter that had too much angular momentum to be incorporated into the hole, it remains outside in this uh, accretion disk. Um, so if you ask what types of, of counterparts we might expect to detect in these events, it's likely to be a strong function of your viewing angle with respect to, to the uh, axis of the binary. Um, if you happen, you know, the idea has been around for a long time that the accretion of this uh, remnant disk onto the newly formed black hole can power a transient jet of relativistic material, at least going back to Pachinsky and, and, and Narayan and Eichler in the 80s and 90s. Um, and so dissipation within this jet could po potentially power a, a gamma ray burst. Um, 
And so again, we're talking about this remnant torus that forms around the black hole. Uh, various groups have studied the formation of these disks. Uh, typically, you have about a tenth of a solar mass in the torus uh, uh, with a size of a few tens of kilometers. Uh, the accretion disks are formed very hot, so all of the uh, you know, complex nuclei that made up the initial neutron star broken down into free neutrons and protons in the disk. This are very dense. Photons are trapped, but neutrinos can cool the disk. So these can actually be neutrino cooled disks. Very interesting. Um, because the disk is degenerate, the weak interactions tend to drive the composition to be very neutron rich. So in the midplane of these accretion disks, the neutron to proton ratio is something like 20. So you could do a very simple estimate, which is just to say, okay, given the size of the disk, we expect there's going to be you know, viscosity due to the magnetorotational instability. What is the characteristic time for the disk to accrete onto the black hole? And for characteristic parameters, that's about a tenth of a second. So you're creating a tenth of a solar mass onto a black hole in a tenth of a second. You know, that's an enormous power. If you're only able to channel a fraction of that into a relativistic jet, you could produce a gamma ray burst. And these have sort of been the theoretical motivations for associating the short gamma ray bursts with, uh, you know, and of course in a collapse star, you might have much larger disk and a longer time scale. Um, and as Winfei discussed uh, on Monday, there is a variety of evidence potentially connecting the short gamma ray bursts uh, and mergers, both the types of galaxies we find them in, both elliptical and star forming galaxies. And also, they tend to be offset from the, the, the centers of, of, of the galaxies in some cases in a way that's consistent with what we might get from, from neutron star kicks. And in some cases, when we look for bright supernova, we don't, we don't see any to very faint limiting magnitudes. I want to say too much. Uh, 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 so this would have been the expectation if we had had a neutron star merger as the first gravitational wave source. And then we saw uh, this, this you know, 0.2 second uh, burst of gamma rays. Uh, you know, potentially many of us would have, would have thought, OK, this is, this, is, this is the counterpart. Uh, uh, this is the, if it, those of you don't know, this is the Fermi uh, potential discovery of, of, a, of a coincident counterpart. I've now heard many uh, uh, people disputing this was not detected by integral and, 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 and claiming that this is, this is not statistically significant or other reasons. I don't want to dispute that. I'll just simply say there have been some ideas proposed to try to get counterparts around black holes. And, and depending on your perspective, they're you know, more or less believable, um, probably uh, uh, you have to have some way. So, I mean, you know, we, we're talking about a time scale again here of, of, you know, you need a compact accretion disk, probably 10 to the minus four solar masses somehow surrounding this merged object. It have to be in a very dense environment, such as the middle of the star. As we discussed yesterday, though, the very massive stars you might expect to produce these might instead go parent stability. Uh, you could try to create a remnant disk uh, uh, that would survive for a very long time, but it's hard to create such a large mass, you know, such a passive disk. Uh, so I don't want to say too much more about this. It's very intriguing. If the next one has this, we'll think uh, more intently about that. I do want to sit back and say, okay, there are any other ways we might be able to make short gamma ray bursts. One idea that's been discussed as an alternative model is the accretion induced collapse of a neutron star. So you have a neutron star, it's accreting from a companion, it spins up, uh, it, it approaches the maximum mass for a neutron star, and then it collapses to a black hole. And if the neutron star is rotating sufficiently rapidly, and if it's sufficiently large, when it collapses, you can imagine the outer parts of the neutron star forming a disk around the newly formed black hole. So with my student, Ben Margulit, we just wanted to address, is this possible? So if I rotate a neutron star as fast as I can at breakup, uh, and, and at the point at the mass where it would collapse to a black hole, does the matter in the equatorial region have enough angular momentum to form uh, accretion disk around the black hole of the same spin and mass? Of course, this depends on the uh, structure of the neutron star, which depends on the equation of state. But you can parameterize the neutron star equation of state by uh, a central pressure and, and an adiabatic index uh, above that and ask in this parameter space, is it possible to form a, a disk? And what he found was you can form a disk in this part of the parameter space, uh, not in the majority of the parameter space. And in fact, the, the, the part of the parameter space which, based, which uh, is set by or you know, is allowed based on the observed masses of neutron stars and radii is up here. And so in fact, you know, we can exclude the possibility that any neutron star consistent with current observations could actually collapse if it were rotating as a solid body to an object that would have a disk. So I think this a, a, neutron star AIC model is, is, is in, in some trouble. And so I think there's, 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 you know, one of the reasons we associate the short GRBs with mergers is actually hard to come up with viable alternatives. And this is one example. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, short gamma ray bursts are great. We, we, we hopefully will have Fermi flying and Swift flying for a very long time. So if there is a gravitational wave source with a short GRB, we'll have a coincidence. But we do think that only a small fraction of gravitational wave events will have short GRBs. You can see this in a few different ways. One is that the volumetric rate of short GRBs is much lower than 
the estimated rate of neutron star mergers, and this is probably because the gamma rays are beamed to a relatively narrow angle on the sky. So maybe at most, you know, a few percent of mergers will actually have associated GRBs. So we have to detect, you know, 50 gravitational wave events before one will have a coincident counterpart. And so that motivates thinking about more isotropic uh, components of emission. So I'm going to focus on this idea of a kilonova, which is a thermal uh, counterpart similar to a supernova powered by the radioactive decay of elements that are synthesized in the ejecta. So the main point is that you have various sources of neutron-rich ejecta. You have the matter that's ejected dynamically. You saw in the simulation the matter that sort of flew out in the equatorial plane. There's also collision between the neutron stars. You can get matter that squeeze out like a toothpaste along the polar direction. This matter, by and large, expands very rapidly, and so it retains the initial composition of the neutron star, which is very neutron-rich. Okay, and typically about a hundredth of a solar mass is ejected this way. You can also have outflows from the remnant accretion disk that forms. These can be both outflows that are driven. You have neutrinos from the inner parts of the disk which heat the outer parts and evaporate some matter. Uh, as the disk viscously expands, you, you, the, the, the free nuclei recombine into heavier elements and this produces some winds. So if you eject about 10% of the disk's mass, actually, you can compete with that ejected dynamically. So this is a very important source of mass ejection in these systems. But unlike the dynamical material, this stuff comes out on a longer time scale set by the disk evolution, which is seconds, and can have a much higher electron fraction. It can be much more proton rich because weak interactions have time to change the composition. So I'm going to show you, this is the uh, uh, nuclear reaction calculation for a single fluid element which is expanding away from the site of the merger. This is temperature and density, so they're decreasing. This is the chart of the nucleides, so you're going to see how these heavy elements are formed. This is rapid neutron capture and nucleosynthesis, so you start off with some heavy seed nuclei and then they capture neutrons because you have such a high neutron density, you're able to neutron capture and beta decay your way up to heavy elements. And then on the top here you'll see a running uh, total of the, of the composition compared to the solar composition. So we're capturing neutrons, we're forming these very heavy elements, and then you run out of neutrons at some point, and then everything sort of slowly decays back to stability, and you end up with a final abundance distribution. I think Enrico will talk about this, which looks remarkably like the solar system. This is a good source for producing the heaviest elements in the universe. It's also a good source for keeping the ejecta hot through radioactive heating. So this is the radioactive power. Uh, for this fluid element as a function of time. If you just had a single decaying nucleus like nickel 56, it would have a half-life and then it would constant radioactive heating and then it would decay exponentially. But here you have hundreds of decaying nuclei. So when you add together the radioactive heating, you get, you know, one, one has a half-life of an hour and then it decays into something with a half-life of three hours and, and so on. And on time scales of days, you get this sort of t to the minus 1.2 behavior in the heating. Um, so as we've had many people discuss, and, you know, supernova is, uh, the peak time of a supernova is largely controlled by diffusion. You equate the photon diffusion time and the expansion time. So if I have a solar mass of expanding material with an opacity uh, similar to that you have uh, in a 1A supernova at 10,000 kilometers per second, you get a peak duration of a few weeks, which is how long a 1A supernova lasts. In a neutron star merger, we have matter that is expanding much faster, uh, a much lower mass. And so if the opacity were the same as in a 1A, we would predict a transient that peaks at about a day. But because there's about a, you know, two orders of magnitude less radioactive material, the peak luminosity is uh, roughly two orders of magnitude lower. And so the initial calculations of this that we did, in fact, you know, showed this, that you could get a transient from this radioactive decay that was about a thousand times brighter than a nova. Uh, so we called these kilonova. Um, th this original models, because we didn't know what opacity to assume for these heavy R, R process elements, we just adopted iron opacity, which is what is present in 1A supernova. Uh, Dan Kaysen showed that was potentially or probably not a, a good approximation, because even if you have a small fraction of these lanthanide and actinide elements in the ejecta, they have these very complex F-shell valence electrons. There's many, in a combinatorial sort of way, there's many transitions, many lines. Uh, and the, the opacity is basically a forest of lines, so the more lines you have, the higher opacity. And what he showed is in the optical, uh, you can have an opacity which is a, about 100 times higher than that of just iron, which is just a, a, has a D-shell valence electron, it's a simpler atom. And so if you include these higher uh, opacities, uh, instead of something that peaks, you know, in a fairly visual blue band on a time scale of a day, the, the matter has to expand further in order to radiate. And so it peaks on a, a somewhat longer time scale at a somewhat lower luminosity. And most importantly, you shift the spectral peak into the near infrared, okay? And this is, uh, th and this was, I didn't want to, this was already discussed several times, but this was sort of the, the motivation for this potential discovery of this red bump in this, in this uh, short gamma ray burst was attributed to, to this 
uh, to this potential kilonova detection after a short GRB. Um, and, and, but this makes follow-up, you know, difficult because if this thing is peaking in the near infrared, it's, it's going to be much dimmer in the optical. And so this is roughly if you, a simple model. If you just have the I band magnitude at 200 megaparsecs, which is the advanced LIGO range, this is roughly the, the, the kilonova light curve. Um, you know, you could see here, and this is roughly the depth to which these, these telescopes could obtain if they sort of dedicated their nights observing. Uh, and what you see is that some of the larger glass LSST dark energy camera may be able to get to these depths, but it's going to be harder for some of the, some of the smaller telescopes. Uh, if it's closer, obviously, those will have, the smaller ones will have an advantage because they can tile the region faster. Um, okay, so the main point I want to say, though, is that whether or not, it may not be this bad. It may not be this bad. Whether or not we get the blue and fast evolving emission or the red and slow evolving emission depends on the composition of the ejecta. If you have neutron rich material, which we know exists to some level in the merger, electron fraction less than 0.27, you're going to get this red thing because you have very, a lot of neutrons, you form these heavy lanthanides. If you have some fraction of the matter that's more proton rich, uh, you don't have enough neutrons to get up to these heavy elements. And so you could have a fraction of the ejecta that has a lower opacity. And this is important because, as I mentioned, the outflows from the accretion disk, unlike the matter ejected dynamically, this has time to experience weak interactions. Its electron fraction will not be exactly that which was in the original neutron star. And so you can imagine a potential two-component model where you, know, you have this tidal material which is coming out in the equatorial plane, is very neutron rich, is producing something red, and you have outflows from the accretion disk in the polar direction. And those could, if the, if the composition of those was sufficiently proton rich or not neutron rich, that could produce uh, some blue emission. And, and how could that happen? Well, you have neutrinos from the disk and you have neutrinos from the hypermassive neutron star, uh, and they tend to convert neutrons into protons. Okay, so you can denutronize this part of the outflow, so you could potentially get uh, both components of the emission in a single event. Uh, and we studied this, uh, yeah, and then eventually I should say that this is all going to be dependent on how long the neutron star survives. If the neutron star is emitting neutrinos for seconds as opposed to milliseconds, that's going to have a big impact on this, on this accretion disk outflow. Um, so with Rodrigo Fernandez, we studied the, the evolution of these uh, accretion disks. We basically just set up a torus, we let it accrete onto the black hole with properties similar to that which is formed in the merger. And we basically counted how much was accreted and how much was unbound in these winds and what the composition of that material was. And we found that about, I'll, I'll run the simulation of the disk. So this is the electron fraction in the middle. This is the torus. You'll see as the thing starts to accrete, weak interactions raise the electron fraction from its initial low value. And then you start uh, losing matter, basically evaporating matter off of the outer parts of the disk. So you find that about 10% of the total uh, torus is ejected this way. So this can be a very important part of the kilonova and its nuclear synthesis. Okay, and it actually also depends on whether or not you have a, a hypermassive neutron star present. If you have a neutron star present in the middle, as I said, it's a very strong source of neutrinos. You can really substantially increase the electron fraction of the outflow in the polar region, okay? It's very different than in the case of a black hole. Um, and in, in particular, as I said, we don't know how long the neutron star survives. And so we did a numerical experiment where we basically artificially collapse the neutron star to a black hole at various intervals in time. So we either have it collapse immediately or delayed by 30 milliseconds or 100 milliseconds, uh, 300 milliseconds, uh, or uh, never collapses. And then we basically quantify how much matter was ejected from the disk and what its composition was. And what we found was is that if, if, you, if you have a very prompt black hole formation, the neutrinos don't have much impact, you have a very neutron rich outflow. But if the neutron star survives for longer than a few hundred milliseconds, which is reasonable, you could turn this red emission blue, okay? So what this means is that the lifetime of the neutron star may be actually imprinted in this kilonova emission if we could detect both the blue and the red component. Uh, so this is a radio transfer calculations from Dan Kaysen uh, where we show the, the, the infrared and optical components from the disk. And you could see it, you know, very prompt collapse, it's almost all red. But if the neutron star survives for 100 milliseconds, it could be much brighter on a time scale of a few days, much uh, more amenable to detection. And there will also be, uh, an angular dependence of the outflow. So as I mentioned, this uh, 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 lanthanide-rich material is probably coming out predominantly in the equatorial plane, uh, and, the, and the outflows from the disk are coming out in the polar direction. So if you're viewing this down the axis, you're going to see this blue and red emission. But then if you are viewing it from the side, the, the bluer emission will be blocked by the high lanthanide opacities. Okay. So there's obviously a lot of degeneracies here, a lot to, to, you know, but I think there's this promise that the very high opacities of these could provide us a very sensitive diagnostic of what conditions the matter experienced in the, in the merger. Uh, 
Um, okay, so I want to return to this issue of, uh, uh, of, of, is there any other way? I mean, so, so what, if, what if they all promptly collapse to black holes and then we're just stuck with this uh, red component? Is that, is that it? Uh, um, one interesting thing, uh, going to a conference a few summers ago, I was w watching these uh, simulations by Andy Bousfine. These are two neutron stars. Uh, in, in his mergers, these particles you see here are, are, are just S-page particles that, that basically when the two neutron stars merge, they, 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 they come out in the polar direction with very high velocities, like a, 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 a shock between the two neutron stars and matter sque squeezes out in the, in the polar direction. And so you get a velocity distribution of the ejected mass in these simulations, which looks something like this. So you have slow matter, which is most of the mass. But then there's a tail of very high velocity material. It's almost like a shock breakout. And these very fast as expanding fluid elements, the ones shown in blue here, are important because they expand so fast that the neutrons don't have time to be captured into the R process nuclei. Okay? So for the bulk of the ejecta, 99%, the R process is very efficient. But in the very outer layers, you might have some free neutrons that didn't have time. They basically froze out. And this is important because the outer layers, the outer 1% is precisely what you observe during the first few hours, right? The longer you look, the deeper you look through in a, in a fugitive, diffusive sense. And on a time scale of a few hours, free neutrons have a half-life of, of minutes. On a time scale of hours, their radioactive contribution to the heating is, is much larger than the R process. So you basically superheat the outer neutron star skin of the ejecta. And this makes it very hot and makes it very blue. And so if you, if you include this in the calculation, you assume there's a 1% of the ejecta is, is free neutrons, uh, you can actually significantly boost the emission over the first uh, a few hours and potentially push it back into the ultraviolet and optical. Um, and so this would make it potentially detectable by, by smaller telescopes if they're able to get on the source uh, very quickly. And I should say there's a number of uncertainties related to this. Uh, not all the groups see this fast ejecta, but they, not, they don't necessarily uh, should be able to given the types of simulations they run. So we don't know yet how robust this, this fast moving material is or, or exactly how to treat its opacity structure yet. But uh, I think this is uh, definitely an area for future work. Okay, I want to return to this question of whether or not uh, uh, black holes always form. So I mentioned at the very beginning that it's possible if you have a low mass binary or a very stiff, let's say the neutron star maximum mass is 2.55 and you merge two, you know, 1.2 neutron stars, 1.2 solar mass neutron stars, you could end up with a final object which never collapses into a black hole. And if that's the case, it will be, or at, only after a very long delay. And if that's the case, it will be uh, characterized by two things. One, it will be very rapidly spinning just by angular momentum conservation. It will be spinning at about a millisecond. And the second is it's likely to generate a very strong magnetic field. Various groups have shown that the merger can amplify the magnetic field easily to 10 to the 15, 10 to the 16 Gauss. So you could have basically a millisecond magnetar sitting in the, in the middle of, of your merger. And this has always uh, intrigued me because there's this fraction of short gamma ray bursts that aren't so short. So in addition to the gamma ray burst itself, I think when Enfei was going to talk about this, didn't have time. There's, there's this fraction of short bursts where they have this spike and then they have this sort of extended tail of X-ray emission. And in many cases, this X-ray emission is, is variable, indicating it comes from ongoing central engine activity. It can be very energetic. Uh, and it's very difficult to understand in a model where we're you know, forming this compact accretion disk uh, that, that's accreting on a time scale of a second onto the black hole. Where is all this, if this is powered by accretion, where is all this matter coming from? Okay. Um, and so you could potentially, uh, and I should also say there's a nice work by Antonio Rowlandson showing that you have some bursts where but, you know, you see, you see what appears probably was some sort of X-ray afterglow, and then there's a very sharp cutoff in the X-ray emission, which uh, she attributes to a, a, a neutron star that maybe collapses to a black hole. So if you do form a millisecond neutron star, it's rotating at a, at, at a millisecond, it's going to be a very strong source of magnetic uh, dipole radiation. It will lose that energy. This is just a dipole spin-down formula. Um, so you're depositing that energy into, into the ejecta over a time scale, perhaps of, of minutes or something. Uh, and that, ma that magnetar wind will be confined by the small amount of ejecta from the merger. And like uh, Andrew showed on the first day, you can even have a fairly quasi-spherical outflow that can be collimated by its environment into a narrow jet. And so you could imagine uh, you know, if this jet continues to produce uh, something akin to a gamma ray burst after the original merger, you could imagine uh, producing through shocks or other mechanisms some extended X-ray emission. It's also possible that you could boost the kilonova emission this way. This is work with uh, Tony Pirro. If, if, even if a jet doesn't escape this environment, 
um, you know, if it's trapped, you know, you're basically forming a scaled down version of the superluminous supernova we discussed yesterday. Instead of s several solar masses of ejecta, you have 10 to the minus two solar masses, but it may still may be enough to reprocess effectively this young pulsar wind nebula you've created to reprocess that radiation into the optical or, or x-rays. And if that's the case, I mean, you only need to get a small fraction out, you can boost the potential kilonova by, by orders of magnitude, okay. So even if these aren't associated with short GRBs, if a small fraction of mergers go through this channel, they could produce much brighter uh, transients, which would be much easier to detect. One way to constrain this in the case of short gamma ray bursts is through radio observations. So if, if you really do have a stable remnant, it has you know, several 10 to the 52 ergs of rotational energy, and it eventually, by hook or by crook, has to dump that medium, uh, dump that energy into the surrounding medium. And because you have such a low ejected mass, you're going to be dumping in it at trans-relativistic velocities. So you have the akin of a, of a like a, 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 you know, a, a very powerful uh, radio supernova remnant. So this should produce very bright radio emission, which, however, uh, will be delayed because you have to sweep up enough ISM. You have this sort of coasting phase, and you have to sweep up enough ISM. So one way you can test the existence of a long-lived magnetar is by monitoring short gamma ray bursts in the radio for years after the explosion. Um, and this was first done in some work with uh, Jeff Bauer. I actually took the data when I was a graduate student because I've been thinking about this idea for a long time with the old VLA. Um, and we did put some upper limits. You know, a few years after the burst, we could put some upper limits on the 1.4 gigahertz radio luminosity. But depending on the density of the ISM, it, it still might not be very constraining to rule out this much energy. Um, but there's some new work now coming out by, by Wenfei uh, uh, that we're going to have some deeper limits. And we may be able to start to rule out uh, these magnetars existing in, in a large fraction of short GRBs. I should also say there was uh, some work by Asif Horace very recently where he put some, some stringent constraints. Again, it, it depends on the density of the medium, but eventually it's going to become uh, uh, challenging. And I should also say that you know, if these millisecond neutron stars are common, they're going to be very uh, prominent sources of radio transients for future surveys. Uh, these, these may be the, if 1% do this, they may be the dominant source that the future surveys like ASCAP and VLA detect. Okay, uh, I am, see Mouncy standing here, so I'm finishing up. So I say there's, there's sort of a wide range of potential counterparts we can get from binary neutron star or neutron star black hole systems that, that, that span the electromagnetic spectrum. I didn't have time to discuss all of them. Uh, span a whole range of times. We might get some sort of precursor as the two magnetospheres of the two neutron stars interact. This might potentially give rise to an FRB. We don't know. They're going to coalesce. We might get uh, accretion of the remnant disk onto the black hole powering a short gamma ray burst. If you have a long-lived neutron star, you might get some sort of you know, extended X-ray emission until it collapses. Uh, or maybe it never collapses. Um, on a time scale of seconds, you have this ejecta undergoing the R process, which Enrico will discuss. On time scales of hours, the free neutrons will decay in the outer layers. It could give you something in the UV or, or, or blue bands. If there's some polar high Y material, we could get a, a blue kilonova. We, the more robust thing is that we will get this red infrared transient. I think it's very hard to avoid that at some level. And then ultimately, as whatever is ejected interacts with the ISM, we could get uh, a radio flare, uh, time scales of uh, months or probably more like years. Um, and so I'll finish there. Thanks. Um, Brian, um, I wondered if you'd like to say a few words about the uh, amount of mass ejected typically. Mm -hmm. um, people have often in recent years suggested it might be quite low, um, but in which case then your kilonova emission may be rather weak. Um, but on the other hand, uh, you know, the, the, one explores a broader range of models, you can find some cases where you, you get sure. quite high mass, and so I wondered how, how you thought that might work out in practice. Yeah, so I think the dynamical ejecta can vary quite considerably. So that's what most simulations focus on. That can go down to 10 to the minus 3 or even smaller in some, for some equal mass binaries. But as I said, you get this outflows from the accretion disk, which I think are very robust. And so if you ever form, if you form a tenth of a solar mass disk, I think it's very hard to avoid ejecting a tenth of that. So I think even if one component of fails, you're going to get something from the other one. So I would be I would be surprised if if the number the total number adding these two together is ever much smaller than about ten to the minus two. But that's just my my feeling. I'm always very happy to see these predictions for the early blue UV uh, uh -huh. flares because this is going to be really trivial to detect with the with the wide field UV. 
space mission like Ultrasat. So, so basically, it's one field of view. And you can okay, be, uh, be there immediately. But um, so, what's the, the now the question? What what are the prospects for um, developing the certainty whether this blue UV? Uh, uh, components exist or not exist. So, right, right. is it going to be as uncertain as, as it is now, or is it going to be more certain in the future? Yeah, no. So, if you're talking about this neutron precursor, I mean, I can give you some more background on that. I mean, there, it, it's only these very fast. These, so, I should say, you know, Andy Bassfine is the one who's it's, yeah, Thomas Yonko's group is the one who's, who's been saying this. They're doing relative. They're basically doing a code that is SPH, but also includes aspects of GR. And uh, and the hydro the the, the grid-based hydro codes can't see this very tiny amount of very fast material because they have too much atmosphere. The SPH codes are the only ones that can see it. Um, but it's also that this fast eject is also produced by the GR effect that you get a very strong collision of the two neutron stars. So there's really only one group that I think could detect this, and and so um, I think you just have to have other groups that are that are doing SPH with GR that can confirm this uh, with higher resolution. So hopefully there will be progress. So the strength of the electromagnetic counterpart, the kilonova, is very sensitive to the amount of mass that is being uh, ejected. Um, can you explain from basic principles why is it 1% or are there circumstances where this might be 10 times bigger? Or what, what sets this number of uh, 10%? The, the, fra the fraction of the mass that is be becoming unbound, so to speak? Uh, I don't know if I have a first principles idea of that. I mean, it definitely seems to depend. If you have equal mass neutron stars, it seems to be very low. So if you have a, a, non, a, a, a non equal mass, you get a much stronger tidal tail, and there's, there's more ejected that way. Um, you know, yeah, much brighter events. If you, get a, if you have a black hole neutron star that actually disrupts the neutron star, you get a lot more ejected. It, that tends to be more of an all or nothing. <laughs> Either you eject a tenth of the, of the, neutron, you know, of the neutron star, you eject nothing. Uh, so those events can eject much more. When you say it's very sensitive, it's true, but I mean the, the peak luminosity goes roughly as the ejective mass to the one half power. So, you know, it, it does depend, but it's sort of a, you know you get a magnitude for every order of magnitude in, in mass. So it's not a hu hugely sensitive. 